rocket ship. Does Black Rock invest in? Thomas Küchenmeister has to analyze a vast amount of data to get a precise picture. This is where Black Rock resides, with 10,000 employees and the power of $4,000 billion to invest. The most powerful man on Wall Street, Black Rock founder and company director Larry Fink, avoids the public eye. He worked for his reputation early on. He made a big name for himself as a young financial pro. He was the first to discover how well mortgage-backed securities could be traded. A huge success until the crisis. And I think of BlackRock's role as the largest investment firm in the world. But even after the crisis, he came back because he knew the toxic assets better than anyone. Everyone wanted him to help clean up the mess. Today, he's considered the man who can best assess risks. The super rich, company bosses, finance ministers, they all come to him. He's probably got the finest single network of relationships of anybody you know, on, on Wall Street. I mean, he's, he, he, he can move markets, he can, he's got his fingers in every pie, every company, uh, you know, everybody courts him, but both on, uh, you know, in Washington and in corporate America and around the world. He's like a spider in a web of power relationships and he plays it all out within the rules of today. He will make very sure he's not breaking any laws. We learn more about networks in Zurich, a banking city. How do they work? At the city's famous technical university, physicist James Glattfelder and his colleagues are examining how power and influence become concentrated in the economy. Nobody has tried doing that before because the sheer wealth of data seems impenetrable. James Glattfelder has managed it. Millions of pieces of global company data and details of holdings ran through the computers. The result is surprising. It goes back to a small core of financial actors who are all mutually networked. We didn't know that beforehand because nobody had looked at this data. This elite consists of just 147 companies. They control almost half the global economy. James Glattfelder believes that control is almost impossible in such a complex network. There are national regulators, but nobody who oversees the entire planet, quite in contrast to the financial giants. The analysis of the scientists in Zurich created a stir. Many wanted to know if it was a global conspiracy. James Glattfelder doesn't think so. These networks organize themselves on their own, like the Internet, where the giants are called Google and Facebook. Here they're called BlackRock and Goldman Sachs. They've all got holdings in each other. They're a group who all own each other. And indeed, the huge investment funds are owned by the well-known big banks like Goldman Sachs. On the other hand, BlackRock and the other funds hold the biggest blocks of shares in these banks. It's a web of mutual participation, and the web is growing. WMF is a traditional South German company that became known around the world for its cutlery and cookware. It fell into the hands of global investors years ago. Then everything changed. Wolfgang Lutz and his son Markus are the fifth generation to work for WMF. Everything looks better from the top. But it hurts them both to see how their company is changing dramatically. Ah, no. WMF is now mainly owned by the investment giant KKR from New York. Since the company has had global money, working conditions have gone downhill. Inwardly, I've said goodbye to WMF. Why? 
It's not the company I knew and loved anymore. Ich gekannt und geliebt habe als Firma. That's good, but some profit. It's all about profit now. More and more profit, never mind the cost. If something's not cost effective, it's binned. And the people are the ones who suffer. Most production now takes place in the Far East. Coffee makers for restaurants are still made here. That's where Markus Lutz works. He can be happy that WMF and their owners are still making a lot of money with the coffee makers, otherwise his job would have gone too. WMF once employed 7,000 people here in Geislingen. Now it's just 1,600. Lutz is tied to the company by five generations. Just like other families in Geislingen, they witnessed WMF going to a Swiss investor who then sold it to KKR at a huge profit. Now they're worried that WMF is merely a ball for the new investors, a ball that they just want to sell on for maximum profit. <laughs> That's when he got his first coffee maker customer service car. The bosses were there for their employees and the people. They went through the factory and asked how everyone was doing. They asked about our families. Their hearts are attached to WMF and their products, but their heads tell them the global investment companies don't care about that at all. <laughs> All these things are from WMF. The cutlery is made in China these days and jobs have disappeared from Geislingen. People are laid off every year. A new wave of layoffs of 20, 50, 60 people. It was them this time, and it could easily be me or anyone. WMF's new ownership structure is also obscure. In a roundabout way, it's owned by Fine Dining Limited, with its headquarters on the Cayman Islands, a tax haven. Fine Dining is owned by the investor KKR in New York, in which FMR and Black Rock have an interest. Money is changing hands, but how and where does it go? Who's in control? More and more German companies are being bought up by American investors, foreign investors. In the past, the German people's savings were made available to medium-sized businesses through loans issued by German banks. Today, the money goes to capital markets and comes together in London or New York. It goes to Frankfurt, too. Then it comes back as share capital via investors and investment companies. We've relayed the pipelines and I doubt whether that was wise. The AGM of Deutsche Bank. Black Rock from New York officially holds 5.14% of its shares. That makes it the bank's biggest shareholder. Outside, activists are protesting against the deals done by the Deutsche Bank, accusing it of participating in arms projects and food speculation. Thomas Küchenmeister of Facing Finance wants to point out the entanglement to the small shareholders. Facing Finance keeps an eye on the deals of the big financial players. While the mock shooting continues outside, Anshu Jain, the new joint CEO of Deutsche Bank, is being feted for his strategy. We were and are determined to make Deutsche Bank fit for the future. We want to create lasting and sustainable values for you, our shareholders.
für Sie, unsere Aktionäre. Blood for profits. That's the critics' message. BlackRock is Deutsche Bank's biggest shareholder. Using money to make more money. That's the main task of investors like BlackRock, says Thomas Küchenmeister. Profits are highest where there's no regulation, and every investor knows it. That's the first rule you learn. That's why investors like BlackRock invest in Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank benefits hugely from environmental destruction and human rights violations. Insiders know that there will be virtually no important decisions in the bank without discussing them with the major shareholder from New York first. What do they look like, the questionable deals that BlackRock and its trillions are involved in? A few days later, Thomas Küchenmeister is on his way to the office of Facing Finance. His colleagues have gathered a lot of data, but it's all from publicly accessible databases. They believe a lot stays in the dark. In its brochures, the financial giant BlackRock pledges to adhere to the guidelines on responsible investing set out by a UN convention. But the experts of facing finance have still spotted many holdings in dubious companies. It's a long list. We've taken the top 10 from this list and we've looked at the extent to which BlackRock is involved in these arms deals. There are drone manufacturers, for example. That's the business of the future. We found investments of 16 and a half billion US dollars, just in the top 10. If we were to look at the entire arms sector, we'd find a lot more. A dirty profits report. Facing Finance has compiled a handbook of which financial companies are involved in the arms business and other manufacturers. BlackRock, with its countless funds, is represented very often, says Thomas Küchenmeister. These examples demonstrate just that. Anglo-American, which has mining operations all around the world, has been criticised because it intimidates local populations with its mines. It harms the environment and it makes the workers sick. Black Rock is involved. In Indonesia, there's the huge palm oil producer Golden Agri. Thousands of hectares of jungle has had to make way for plantations where monocultures are now grown for fuel. In the United States, there's the seed company Monsanto, which is controversial all over the world because of its genetically modified products. Then there's the producer of electronic weapons systems, Raytheon, which is building this missile. Raytheon sells its products to many armies around the world. BlackRock is again part of it. Such holdings are hard to discover. Of course, Black Rock employees don't talk about it. They keep to themselves. Before the crisis, bankers were happy to talk. Now Wall Street has gone completely silent. It's a necessary evil. They, they don't want to do it because then people might figure out what they do there. They like it without anybody knowing what they do. That's why they, you know, survive. Black Rock hears every pin drop. One of the largest computer systems in the world, called Aladdin, calculates the economic consequences of an event in milliseconds. That's a massive competitive advantage. BlackRock sells it as a service to others, which gives it control over another $15 trillion. Risk assessment is big business. BlackRock knows where it's worth it. Even Formula One drives on BlackRock money. They're involved in the rating business too, with a holding in the parent company of Standard & Poor's.
BlackRock started making really big money after the crisis. On behalf of the US government, bankrupt banks were liquidated and first aid administered to the American mortgage market. Later, the experts from New York looked into Greece's finances, commissioned by the Greek Central Bank. A crisis is always good for business and state debts are particularly good. States are becoming more and more dependent. You can refinance them, you can advise them, you can earn money advising them and you can earn money through loans. You can earn money through debt conversion, you can earn money when parts of Greece are privatised or bought up by private investment companies. This breakup of traditional state structures in the economic sector plays right into the hands of this area of financial industry. The BlackRock empire has also benefited massively from this in the past five years. There are subsidiaries all around the globe which have set up hundreds of different funds. One example is the tax haven of the Cayman Islands. A look at the database of the financial administration there lists more than 70 BlackRock funds. Michael Smallberg is surprised at this rapid development. His organization is called Pogo. It keeps an eye on the state as well as on BlackRock. The company got lucrative contracts from the government after the financial crisis, without them having been put out to tender. That's very shady. For us, the concern was that BlackRock was managing all sorts of investments in the same types of securities that it was evaluating for the government. So even though they might keep the two teams separate, there's really an inherent conflict of interest there. And the government was in an, in an emergency situation, so it had to rely on the private sector, on a company like BlackRock. But really, it, ideally, it should have been a government official working on this program, managing the US taxpayer dollars. Because otherwise, at the end of the day, BlackRock's really serving two masters. It's not just Michael Smallberg who's examined this case. The deal was also worth a debate in Congress, but without further consequences. BlackRock has a powerful lobby and is excellently networked. The Treasury Secretary is well acquainted with BlackRock CEO Larry Fink. Michael Smallberg is certain BlackRock is too big. Especially when it has so many different entangled relationships, not only with companies, but also with the governments that are regulating those companies. And you have to consider how much inside information they're getting from their work with the government and how many different conflicting positions they have. Yeah, when they make a move, it's the kind of thing that can really move markets and, and shape the financial system more broadly. So I think they do need to be put under a stricter regime of oversight, both in this country and internationally. It wasn't just BlackRock that fought to prevent stricter laws regulating their global dealings to be passed. The Dodd-Frank Act wanted to make the work of investment companies more transparent. Politicians thought it was a good law until the lobby mobilized. The Dodd-Frank Act addresses critical gaps and weaknesses in the U.S. regulatory framework, many of which were revealed by the recent financial crisis. All that's happened is that the Wall Street firms have paid millions of dollars to their lawyers and their lobbyists to dismantle piece by piece whatever Dodd-Frank was supposed to be. It doesn't do anything. As I said before, nothing has changed on Wall Street. The consequences of the unbridled financial system affect people all over the planet. The tenants' representative, Christel Hoffmann, is having a lot of trouble with the flats and the neighbourhood. She's fighting with the new investor, TAG, which global investment funds like BlackRock are involved in. There are lots of complaints, but nothing gets done. There's this neighbouring flat, for example. This tenant has carried buckets of water out of her flat and if she didn't have tiles, it would have seeped through to the flats below. 
She's been getting other committed residents like Ronan Bernhardt together. She records all the problems and passes them on. Maybe something will happen this time. It doesn't have to be this way. We're a few hundred meters away in the same neighborhood. Things are better here, and there's a reason for that. Look at this. It looks good. Nothing here is dripping or crumbling. It's obvious right away that the landlord isn't taking money out of the property. He's investing it. This is a collective, while that over there is an investment company. They want money. They don't want to invest. The tenants here are members of the cooperative, and the fundamental idea behind it all is quite different here. It shouldn't be possible for investors just to make money without maintaining some kind of standard and then just sell again if it's not working. A short while after we finish filming, something does happen. Christel Hoffmann remains skeptical. She's been disappointed too many times before. There's more skepticism at WMF. Markus Lutz still works there, but the former colleagues from the logistics department have been outsourced. Their new company is called Prolog. In this company, the management wants to cut costs. Things are bubbling. A works meeting. Rationalizing, outsourcing, cutting costs, that's the goal of the investor. That's the logic of the system. Bernd Rattay from the Metal Workers Union is fighting against the dismantling of social achievements by the new investors. In the negotiations, we were constantly confronted with statements like, look, on the Polish border, they do it for five euros an hour. We're doing you a favor by paying you nine euros fifty. We were told a minimum wage of eight euros fifty was up for discussion. So nine euros fifty was great. It's a strange situation. It's about wages, working hours and holiday pay for them. In short, their future. The demands are getting tougher all the time. They want to take things from us, wherever they can. It was our WMF, but now? The next question is, what will come after 2015? We don't know. Bernd Rattay, the trade unionist, tells former WMF employees the result of the negotiations with the employer. At least the threat of low wages has gone. But in return, everyone has to make sacrifices, such as unpaid overtime. The American investor is aiming for big profits. There are no illusions in Geislingen, and Geislingen is everywhere. The financial industry moves money around the globe. Every crisis, every billion of new state debt means redistribution. Less at the bottom and more at the top. Wealth has exploded. In 10 years, the number of billionaires in the world has quadrupled. The big money deals have moved to the companies in the shadows, where nobody can see the cards in their hands. Huge concentrations of power have formed. That is happening while governments aren't paying attention. 
That's happening in the banking sector and the investment fund sector. It's allowed right now because the dominant neoliberal doctrine of free markets demands it. But you'll know if you've ever played Monopoly that free markets aren't as free as you think, because in the end, you have a few powerful players who own the world. So free as you think, that's what you see later, when you play Monopoly once again. At the end, there are only a few powerful players. You can't do it without rules. The only one who quasi the rest of the world Without limiting size, we won't get a handle on the problem. The incredible power of companies like BlackRock is troubling. The network among the giants at the top of the financial world sinister, because the really big money relentlessly subordinates the planet to profits, and that affects millions of people in many locations. Financial companies obstruct everything that could regulate them, and they continue to grow even richer. <laughs>